uh, take the precautions we need to take, and so we're glad you're, unfortunately, we're glad you're not in the building, but we hope you're still with us this morning, and you can be joining with us in prayer, and, uh, and paying attention to the scriptures, letting the scriptures move you, and uh, truly be inspired this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin uh, with a word of prayer from our Director of Christian Education, Jen Ostrafel. Good morning again, welcome this morning. If you would bow with me for prayer. Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. We are living in a time of uncertainty. You hear our cries. Lord, let us put our hope in your unfailing love. It is you who redeems us. It is you who breathes life into our dry bones. I pray for our faith to be only in you, God. I pray that even when we struggle to see the way in which you work, that we trust that our faith in you will bring glory to you. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life that we pray. Amen. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you were going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Our next scripture reading this morning comes from Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me into the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord said to these bones. I will make breath enter you and will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them and came to life, and stood upon their feet a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. 
Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Our final reading this morning is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that this would really be uh, good and encouraging to, to everyone who can't be here today. Uh, because the, the world is changing and, and we have to change with it. And uh, it's interesting, this whole thing happened in the season of Lent. And, uh, you know, Lent is traditionally a season of sacrifice, <laughs> a season of giving things up. And so, uh, uh, a season of self-discipline and we've been learning, having to learn how to sacrifice, how to give things up, you know, for that's what Lent's supposed to be and for many years perhaps the churches have ignored or sidestepped these practices at least people, uh, we seem to kind of push them off to the side but it seems the whole world is forced now to understand what it is to engage the Lenten practices in a way uh, as they certainly give things up give up going to school. I don't think the kids are upset about that. But uh, maybe the homeschool, homeschool, they'll think it again. Uh, you know, they give up so much stuff. Give up going to the store, going to the, out to eat. Uh, we like these things, but uh, if only when we give up all these other things, we can convince the world their need to pray as they give these things up. To read scripture throughout this season of doing without. Of course, the season of Lent ends with the celebration of Easter. And while this time of isolation may not end that soon uh, in America, Easter is still and always cause to celebrate. As we have been through uh, our Lenten journeys, we're continuing on our Lenten journey, we've been looking through uh, what Jesus says about himself, who he declares himself to be through the I Am statements as we try to look at who is Jesus. We want to understand him as he wants us to understand him, not as we choose to understand him. And today is no exception. Today, as we hear how Jesus describes himself in the Gospel of John chapter 11, we see really what's the perfect description for us and uh, uh, today and for all the fears that the world is embracing because Jesus is clear in who he is. And he is who we need now more than ever. Uh, as the world is so afraid of all that's going on, Jesus, we talked last week, is the Good Shepherd to comfort us, to help us, to guide us. And he is literally in the midst of a, a funeral in the passage today. And we see how he comes to bring peace, hope, resurrection, and life. But don't take my word for it. Let's see what the Bible says. Look in John, if you will chapter 11. We've already set up the story for you. Reading the first 17 verses, the first 16 verses, verse 17, we're going to pick it up. Jesus had previously been run out of Jerusalem. At the end of chapter 10, which we talked about last week with the Good Shepherd, the Pharisees realized, the religious leaders realized he was blaspheming God. At least that's what they understood. He was claiming to be equal with God. He said in, in John 10, 30, the Father and I are one. He certainly, he understood who he was. He knew who he was. He knew it was true. But the religious leaders, uh, well, they didn't like that. They knew he was declaring himself equal with the Father. And they tried to stone him. They ran him out of town. He was literally running for his life. He and his disciples. And they went in hiding, so to speak. And while he was in hiding, the word came to him that his friend Lazarus was sick. And that Lazarus' sisters were begging Jesus to come and heal him. He said, come and heal him. Jesus, on the other hand, decided, I'm just going to stay where I am for a couple days. It seems almost rude in a way, but uh, of course, Jesus knows more than we do. In this case, you're wondering. He always knows more than we do. And Jesus apparently was the one practicing, you know, social distancing. I mean, he kind of did that right off the bat, right? I'm going to stay away for a couple days, and maybe things will get better. Just kind of kidding. But uh, seriously, he stayed a couple days. And then he told the disciples, we're going to go back in towards Jerusalem, back into Judea. And the disciples protested that Jesus, they were just trying to kill you there. Why do you want to go back? It's dangerous. We really don't, don't want to go back. And Jesus said, look, I'm not going really uh, because I'm afraid, because I'm not. But I'm going to help somebody. I'm going for Lazarus because he's asleep. The disciple was like, well, he can wake up. You know, he don't need you to wake him up. He knocks the alarm clock. Just like, you don't get it. Okay, really, he's dead. I didn't want to tell you that at first, but I'm telling you, he's dead. I'm going to go. I'm glad he's dead because you're going to see something amazing. 
That sounds kind of harsh too, for your sake I'm glad he said. But he knew what was coming, and they didn't. Jesus, let's just go, and I appreciate, um, appreciate Thomas. Because they were not in an optimistic attitude, but Thomas said, well, he's dead. Why don't we all just go die with him? <laughs> they were really afraid. They were really scared. So they didn't know what to do. They could have stayed and let Jesus go, but their whole, their whole three years with Jesus, they knew, go where Jesus is and you'll be okay. Stick where Jesus is and you'll be okay. No matter what comes against us, they're throwing stones, we're okay. We're hungry, we're okay. No matter, we're in the midst of a boat just rocking. Guess what? We're okay. Because we're with Jesus. So instead of staying where they were and let Jesus go, they went with them. They weren't that concerned because they knew they had Jesus. So this is the background for the story. They were going into Bethany, which was just uh, really close to Jerusalem, where there's people who wanted to kill him. Government officials, they went into this. Apparently there was some sickness there, because Lazarus all of a sudden got sick and died. So they're going into the sickness infested area, where government officials were cracking down, I guess, at least against Jesus. And uh, they said, we're going anyway. How's that for a setup for the story, huh? And that doesn't even include the two sisters who had pleaded and their pleas were ignored. I mean, who knows how they could be when he gets there. When they're crying out and Jesus doesn't show up. But well, this is where we pick it up in verse 17 of John chapter 11. If you have a Bible with you at home, you can turn, turn to that. Or if you have your Bible app on your phone, you can turn to that as well. It says in verse 17 of John chapter 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Wow. Now it's unclear how far Jesus had to travel from where he was to Bethany. But it was likely less than a day. Uh, that means in all likelihood, Lazarus was already dead by the time Jesus got the news that he was sick. We know that he was just across the Jordan. And it, the Jordan is not that far from Jerusalem. It probably wasn't more than a couple hours away. But when he got the news, Lazarus might have already been dead. Maybe that's why Jesus didn't rush back. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute, why he didn't rush back. But Jesus clearly, in my opinion, knew far more than we do. He knew there was no sense in making the trek right then. That wasn't uh, what he wanted to do, what he needed to do. Sometimes it's hard for Jesus to hide his omniscience. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for him to hide his all-knowingness. But in this case, it's kind of obvious. He, he knew... He didn't need to go. When they mentioned four days, it seems kind of strange, but it's important, and it's important the reason why Jesus delayed. We'll talk about that in a minute. Before let's continue, verse 18 it says, Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Two miles is not a far distance at all if you're used to walking. For me, it might be, might be a little bit trick. But for you used to walking two miles and not a far distance. So clearly there were many who came from Jerusalem from where they attempted the attempt at stoning of Jesus had just occurred. Many people who had known and heard of, many people who had witnessed Jesus' and miracles came from Jerusalem. Many people were there uh, who witnessed his run-ins with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders. Many were there who had heard him teaching in the temple when they brought the woman caught in adultery to him. He was right there in the temple of Jerusalem. They'd seen, they'd heard, they'd witnessed all this. They knew Jesus. But it's important to note that it was on the fourth day because this is, uh, the fourth day is an important Jewish custom. See, the first three days when someone passes away, it's a private family time. No one's supposed to come. It's supposed to be alone. If Jesus had come immediately, he would have gotten there during those first three days. So Jesus knew not to come. That's why he waited the two days. It wasn't because he was callous. It wasn't because he was uncaring. But he knew the custom was to wait for four days. No one else really, really knew that it was going to be that long. But Jesus knew when to come. So he got there at the right time. Plus on the fourth day, all those from Jerusalem came. They didn't come day one, two, and three. If he had come 
from day one, two, and three to do this great thing he's about to do. The only people that would have seen it would have been the disciples, Martha, Mary, and, well, Lazarus. But it was a bigger deal than that. So it was important he waited those two days. It's important that he got there on the fourth day. Because that's when everyone was showing up, when the crowds were there to mourn. The crowds came to grieve with the sisters. It's important that Jesus had a reason to wait, even though not everyone was keen on him delaying his arrival. Verse 20 to 21 revealed how he was received when he got there. But Martha, listen to what Martha says in verse 20 and 21. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I know that Martha usually gets a bad rap. When we talk about Martha, we usually think of Martha, Martha, Martha. You know, when, uh, when she was trying to take care of things in the house, Mary was just sitting there at Jesus' feet. Martha's doing all this work. And Martha goes to Jesus, Jesus, Mary's just sitting here. Can you get her help? Can you get her to help me or something? Not you, Mary. You know. Mary's just sitting there. Can you get her to get up and help me? And so we kind of think Martha got a bad rap, but uh, Jesus used that incident, of course, to reveal the importance of learning all that he had to teach. But it did not diminish his relationship with Martha. You see, in fact, I think it reveals how comfortable Martha was to be able to say what was ever on her mind to Jesus. How many people would go to Jesus who everyone at that time was knowing was a great healer, a great teacher, a great prophet, and just reproach him that way? But Martha had a relationship, a friendship, that allowed her to speak candidly, openly, and honestly. I think that's what we all need. We all need to be able to tell Jesus what's on our mind. If we have an issue with somebody, instead of, you know, Dealing with it the wrong way, go to Jesus with it. <laughs> That's a good thing. And Martha did that. And then when she finds out that Jesus is there, she wasn't begrudging Jesus because of what he said last time. No, she went to see him. And she was still open, honest. She was eager for his arrival. And her first words continued her candid method of talking when she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You can hear her heart. You can hear her faith. You can hear her trust. She calls him Lord, even though he's clearly a friend. Because Jesus can be both of these things. You can write that down. Because he is to me. And I hope he is to you. A Lord, the Lord, and my friend. And Martha believed without a doubt. So this is tremendous. She believed without a doubt that Jesus could have saved Lazarus from dying. We don't know what the sickness was. We don't know what the issue was. They didn't have a name for it back then. Maybe novel coronavirus one. I don't know what it could have been. It could have been anything. It could have been something simple. Uh, but regardless, she knew if Jesus had been there, With all the faith, we hear the anguish. We also hear the sadness. We hear the missed opportunity. If you had been here, it's almost as though she's saying, why weren't you here? But her statement doesn't end there. Because her faith is stronger than most of us would believe. Though we give Mary credit for great faith, Mary just stayed at home still. When Jesus came, Martha, always doing, got up and good, went to meet him. She couldn't wait. So apparently, Martha picked up some great nuggets in her faith, even while she was busting tables. Because listen to what she says in verse 22. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. She said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that if you, God will give you whatever you ask, even now. Still had hope. Still believed. Even though she sat for three days knowing her brother was dead, she still believed Jesus could do something. 
That's called faith. I know God will give you whatever you ask. Part of this may be hopeful. I think it is. And it's important. But I believe her. I think she's earnest. I think she's professing her trust and faith in Jesus that he can do the unthinkable. He can do the afford unmentioned. No one would believe such a thing. And yet she proclaimed it. The miracles that would shock the world. She said, even now you can do whatever. Hallelujah. That's my Jesus. And Jesus knows it to be true. He's not denying that. <laughs> kind of, yeah, you're right. In verse 23, he reveals. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. He said this to a matter of factly. Perhaps quite pastorally. And he knows exactly what he means. But I'm not sure she does. She knew that Jesus could do whatever. God would give whatever he asked. But I'm still not sure she really expected what was going to be coming. Jesus knew as he knew from before he made a trip to Bethany. He knew because he told his disciples what was going to happen. He knew that he was going to do the most dramatic miracle the world had ever seen. Spoiler alert, if you haven't read the rest of the chapter. He's going to make this guy who is dead for four days, who the Bible says he stinketh because he's been dead, you know, they're starting to not smell so good. He's going to make him come back to life, raise him from the dead. He knew that's what's going to happen. That indeed, God would give whatever he asked, just as she said, and that she would be thrilled. Jesus knew all that, but I don't think she perceived it the same way. Because although she proclaimed God's power, verse 24 seems to show that she heard Jesus remark, your brother will rise again, a little differently. Because she says in verse 24, Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. At the last day. When everything's over, I know he's going to come back then. She believed in the resurrection at the end, the last days, although... There was a disputed theology of the time. The Sadducees denied the idea of the resurrection. The Pharisees clearly taught it. And Jesus taught that there would be a resurrection at the end of the world. Where God would bring consolation to the afflicted. Martha believed in the end times resurrection. But Jesus was about to redefine this also. He was going to change it forever. And he has as to what this means. In verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. <sighs> Hallelujah. This is who Jesus is. And who is Jesus? He is the resurrection and the life. Those who do good. He says, the one who believes in me will live. 
even though they die. Death is not a problem anymore for those who believe in Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is resurrection and life. Dying is a concern for the short-sighted. Dying is a concern for those who don't believe in Jesus. Dying is a concern for those who don't understand that he gave his life so that we might live. But for those who believe in him, death is not an issue at all. Because even though we die, yet shall we live. That's not my words. They're right in the book. They're in the book. Hallelujah. That's good news. That's a promise worth holding on to. Believe in Jesus. And you have resurrection and life because that is who he is. Jesus continues in verse 26. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? When our life is found by believing in him, we will never die. The new life we get from Jesus will last forever. It's not a temporary life. Our belief, our faith gives us eternal life. Not meantime life, not for a little while life, uh, but a life that never dies. Hallelujah. We want to live. Jesus said, I, I am the way you can live. That's what we proclaim. This is what Jesus declares. This is what he promises because of who he is. He is the resurrection and the life. But then it all comes down to what he says at the end of this pronouncement. He says to Martha, do you believe this? That's a great question. I love that question. That is the question that all of us have to answer. It's really the only question that we need to answer. Do you believe this? It's what we must wrestle with. Not because it's an easy answer. Not because it's a throwaway. It's not a phone in. This is serious business. Do we believe in Jesus? Do we believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Do we believe that he raised us up from the dead and that we will be alive forevermore? Because our life, our eternal life, depends on it. I love that Jesus doesn't just make the statement, I am the resurrection and the life, and just goes on with it. But after he makes the statement, he makes the ask. So often we share, Jesus is, is the life, Jesus is the way, you must believe in Jesus, but then we don't ask. We don't have the follow-up, the altar call. We don't have the decision time. Do you believe this? What do you believe? Martha had to answer for herself. She couldn't answer for Lazarus. She couldn't answer for Mary. She couldn't answer for what Jesus was going to do or not do with her brother. The thing I love about the way she answers, what she answered, this whole conversation, really has nothing to do with Lazarus. The question is not what do you believe about Lazarus, it's what do you believe about Jesus. It was about her and him. Martha and Jesus. What does she believe? Because only she could answer. And only you can answer for you. Do you believe? I hope that you do. Because that's where life is. And I know how Martha answered. Verse 27 tells us. Yes, Lord. She replied. I believe that you are the Messiah. The Son of God who was to come into the world. Martha answered, yes. Do you believe this? Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe. She confessed faith in Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, the Son of God. She believed and had no doubt, even though Jesus had not done his great miracle yet. Oh, <laughs> this is, we all often lose this. She believed while Lazarus was still dead. She had just said, if you'd have been here, he'd have, he'd have brought him back to life, or he'd, he'd have lived, but he's dead. The question is, do you believe in me? Yes! He didn't do the miracle yet. Her belief had nothing to do with the circumstances that surround her. Her belief 
did any super miracle. It wasn't a, well, I'd like to believe, let's see what you do with Lazarus first. It wasn't like that. Because she had a relationship. She had a friendship. She knew who he was. She knew who he is. She believed in the person of Jesus, not just in the miracles. She believed in his identity, not his productivity. She believed because of relationship, not because of a contract or a bargain with God. Hallelujah. She believed because of who he is, not because he has answered every prayer that she ever prayed. Yes, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Hallelujah. That's the question. We know as the story continues, Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead. We know as the Bible says, yes, he did stick. He was all bound up in cloth and, and he started stumbling out and they had to unwrap him. We know there's a great crowd was there that was astonished. And we know that many would believe in Jesus because of this. But Martha believed in spite of this or without this at all. Even if it had never happened, Martha still believed. I wonder how our faith is. Even if nothing ever happens when we pray, do we still believe? Do we need something dramatic to believe? Martha believed in Jesus, not in what he did. And so can you. Jesus did all those things so that many would believe. And if you believe because of him, that's great. But don't make your belief in God a bargain. Don't make it contingent upon anything. Because regardless of what is going on in the world, tragedy, pandemic, economic collapse, the question still remains, do you believe in Jesus? Because when it all comes to the end, that's the only thing that really matters. Life, resurrection, choose to believe in the resurrection and the life. Amen. We're going to do something really strange for our first live stream. I'm going to have an altar call without an altar. I mean, hopefully you have one at home. But I can't preach this message without giving an altar call. Because you have to make the choice, you have to make the decision. So I'm going to pray, and if you want to pray with me, I hope you will. I hope the Holy Spirit is moving and working, and that you can confess you have a relationship with Jesus. And if you don't, then you want one, because He wants you to have it. He wants to know you. He wants to build this personal relationship. So I'm going to pray, and if you want to pray with me, wherever you're at, just pray. And I believe in the God that I know. He will hear you, and He will answer you, and He will come to you. And you can have this promise, this assurance of eternal life today. So if you bow with me and pray, dear Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe in you. Yes, Lord. I know that you love me. I know that you've done great things to show who you are. I know that you've proclaimed who you are. Lord Jesus, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. I know you love me, and I want to love you. I know you've done great things. I know you've done miracles. I know you've created me in your image. I know that you are the resurrection and the life. And even though I may not see a great miracle in my life today, I might, I may, but my belief is not contingent upon that. I believe you can do great things, whatever you ask. I still believe that. But Lord, right now, I just want to confess I believe in you. And I want you to be in my life. I want to confess my sins before you. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I've done wrong. Help me to get better. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me to be more like you. Lord, forgive me of my sins so that I can be washed white as snow. Thank you for loving me, for proving that love by dying on the cross. And by resurrecting from the grave, proving that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, allow me to be with you forever and to live and never die. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah.